This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Isotope, Sonarworks, and API. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Spectra 1964 STX100 mic pre in an API lunchbox mixed carefully through Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. And I remember before that, I never bounced things. I never wanted to hear it outside of the studio. And every night he would burn a CD and pass it around to everybody and just say, hey, check this out tonight. If you have anything that you feel about it or whatever, just let me know tomorrow. And I think those are the moments you can think like, oh man, we recorded it too slow or we have too much stuff going on or these drums sound awesome or they're not right. It allows you to kind of hear the song as a listener would hear it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. In my studio, I've got the Mac Mini M1 paired up with the OWC Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 4 Certified Storage and Hub Expansion Solution to connect to all my dedicated audio drives, sample libraries, and backup drives. It's the perfect size to stack with the Mac Mini and add storage and connectivity over Thunderbolt or USB. Whether you have the new or older Mac Mini, nothing stacks up in your studio quite like OWC. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. The Spectra 1964 C610 comp limiter brings fast, clean, quiet compression and limiting to your recordings and mixes. The C610 includes the famous Spectra 101 amplifier used in legendary studios like Stax, Arden, and Record Plant. I love using my C610s for drums, vocals, guitars, and especially bass, which now sounds bigger than anything I've ever recorded before. Make your mixes rock at spectra1964.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Chad Copeland, an American producer, audio engineer, musician, and songwriter from Norman, Oklahoma. He's best known for his production work with Bronco, Sports, Will Dorado, Laney, Ben Rector, Andrew Bell, Suf John Stevens, Third Eye Blind, and engineering for pop artists Christina Perry, Kelly Clarkson, Sasha Sloan, and Avril Lavigne, to name just a few. Chad engineered Christina Perry's Top 40 song, A Thousand Years, which went 10x platinum. Nicely done. He also was nominated for a Grammy for producing and engineering all sons and daughters record Poets and Saints. He works out of his Norman, Oklahoma-based studio Black Watch, as well as spending time in Nashville, L.A., and Sonic Ranch outside of El Paso, Texas. He's a big synth player and has amassed a collection of vintage synths, which I'm psyched to talk about. Um, and he says he has an obsession with short-scale guitars and plays bass on a lot of records as well. I think I've also got a video that I found of you playing organ on a record, which looked awesome. Um, and Chad's really interested in finding creative ways to sort of, you know, do cool things and, and breathe life into a recording. Um, a lot of the records that we've put in a playlist together for you, rock stars, really, really great sounding. And so I'm really excited to talk about the way, um, Chad, that you've made all these records. Uh, I know you you guys went to great lengths to do some very cool stuff. So a big shout out and a thank you to Ryan Hewitt for making our introduction. Thank you so much, Ryan. Please welcome Chad Copeland to Recording Studio Rockstars. Chad, are you ready to rock, my friend? I'm ready. Dude, great to have you here on the show, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I kind of you know, gave a brief introduction to you, but if you want to give us, you know, this short version in your own words about how you got into all this stuff, um, we'd love to learn more about you. Yeah, I, uh, I think I fell into it a little bit. My high school piano teacher was really into recording and he was in a band in the sixties that had like a big number one hit. I can't remember their name, but my parents knew who they were. But he had a really cool studio at his house. And every time I'd go over there, I'd play his Hammond organ and Borley and Rhodes and all that stuff. He was really into that. 
And so, yeah, that just kind of started a love for recording, a love for those vintage synths. And I, uh, I got a four track mini disc recorder when I was a junior in high school and recorded my friends and had a lot of fun doing that. And then wanted to go digital. And I remember going to the music store and they had an Insonic Paris rig. Oh um, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, I was going to ask if you remember those. They sound incredible. But I asked for that for my graduation present. I got that. Went into college and started meeting, you know, <laughs> this guy plays over here, this guy plays here, and basically recorded, you know, this kind of acoustic guitar and learned some things. And that was fun because that was back in the days where, you know, in the summer when we weren't in school, we could spend three days trying to get a snare sound. <clears throat> And go to the music store and say, hey, why does this snare on this record sound so good? And he's tuning our snare and helping us with changing the beater of the kick and helping us get drum sounds, telling us about, oh, yeah, you should change acoustics. You should try nylon strings. You should try this. And so we would just explore. And I got a lot of good experience in that, in that time. Um, and that's all forward, in Oklahoma? Yeah, all in Oklahoma. Fast forward a few years. I met Craig Alvin, um, amazing engineer who's been on the show, I believe. Um, and he, I was working on a record for um, a guy named Ryan Lindsay here in town. Craig heard it and was like, man, I'd love to mix this. We talked to him, worked it out. And Craig moved to Oklahoma City for a couple of years before he moved to Nashville. Um, most recently recorded Casey Musgraves' um, last record, won a Grammy for that. Yeah. Anyways, he, uh, he was working at a really cool studio here in Oklahoma City. And basically for the next couple months mix ryan's record we did it all analog so all the recalls we'd have a song up on the console for three or four days and editing and adding stuff and changing stuff and we were close to being done but he had some great ideas and um he taught us how to edit vocals he taught us a lot of things and basically pulled me aside after that whole process and was like man i think you're a great engineer i think that you should do this and i think that you should get pro tools um, because in Sonic Paris was crashing a lot and we just had a bunch of problems with it. Um, it was kind of when they were starting to not support it anymore and yeah. right before it quit. Was Craig so, well versed in Insonic also? Well, no, we had to run, we couldn't transfer digitally because my Paris rig wasn't up to date and they'd only supported, um, they didn't support Mac after a certain version. So we had to run 16 channels out analog into Pro Tools and then line them up if we had more than 16 tracks. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, so we uh, he told me to get Pro Tools and I remember I talked to my parents about it and um, I had a friend that had gotten into some financial trouble and was selling an HD3 rig for and two distressors for $12,000. I didn't have the money. And my parents reminded me that when I was... 12 years old, I had turned pins on a lathe. This is kind of a weird side <laughs> side story here. And I sold them at my parents' store and I made some money. And I, my parents were trying to teach me about accounting and whatnot. And I met with a financial advisor when I was 12. And I put that money into a mutual fund. Fast forward to when I'm 22, I don't remember anything about that. But they were like, you know, you still have some money left over. We should go to the bank and see what's in that mutual fund or go to the financial advisor. And I ended up having about the exact amount of money I needed to buy Pro Tools, which was awesome. Wow. So that was kind of when I I launched right in at that moment. And and then Craig started taking me on some trips where he, he needed some help with some keys and knew I knew how to arrange music, but I wasn't a great engineer. And he taught me how to beat detect and taught me how to record vocals and taught me taught me a lot. Um, that was just a, a great time for me as an engineer and a producer and I could never say thanks to him enough for that. Yeah, thank you again, Craig. Craig's also been a wonderful guest on the show and um, has taught one of the courses, the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass over in our academy as well. He's great. Yeah, he's killer. So yeah, um, and then from there, it was just meeting people and doing more records. And I mean, that was probably 10 years ago and I've just put my head down and made records since then. That was probably 14 years ago. And so you spend some time in Norman recording, then also El Paso, and then Nashville and and LA as well. 
<clears throat> yeah, so I have a studio here called Black Watch that I co-own with um, Jared Evans. Uh, he's one of my good friends, and um, there's two rooms at the studio. So we, he does a lot of video stuff as well. So he um, is busy doing that too. But yeah, I work out of Black Watch, and then I love Sonic Ranch in El Paso, Texas. It's an incredible place. I was just down there for two weeks. Just got back a few days ago um, with a band called Will Dorado. And man, um, it's a beautiful place. If you know. I go to LA once every few months, just tr try to keep in touch with my friends there. Some great studios out there. They're quite a bit more expensive. Um, and then Nashville, I try to go to about the same amount just to keep in touch and work and learn and all that. Is Norman or is Oklahoma and, you know, just driving south gets you into Texas? I'm trying to picture how, you, how it all is on the map. Yeah, I'm about two and a half hours north of Dallas. Okay, uh, all right. Right by Oklahoma City. Right on. Um, well, very cool. Well, now, as I mentioned, you know, we put a play playlist together of records that you've done and rock stars. You can find that. Just scroll down into the, the show notes and you'll find it. Um, but really cool setting stuff, Chad. When, when I just pressed play, I was like, holy shit, this sounds great. <laughs> so um, I'm very excited because you also mentioned that you've, um, you did a bunch of cool you know, trickery, studio trickery, you could almost say. Like you just you went you went out of your way to do some really cool things to get these sounds and these records. So I'm excited to talk to you about that. Um I like to ask guests when when they start out on the show sometimes to just kind of share a story about an important failure for them or a nightmare in the studio moment that maybe turned into a great learning experience. Do you have anything that comes to mind for you right off the bat reg regarding that? I mean, because you've you're doing all this great work, but it can't have always been. Uh, oh man, you know, super yeah. easy, right? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a couple stories that come to mind. Um, recording this band, Bronze Radio Return. The sing the singer really likes to record himself because he doesn't like the pause between an engineer hitting record, and he knows when he messes up and he wants to stop it immediately and. So we set him up, uh, um, we did it at Sonic Ranch and in, in Oklahoma at my studio. We've worked both places, but we've had great success with it. But one time <clears throat> we set up a, uh, <laughs> a little mobile rig for him in the back studio and we, um, you know, treated the room really heavy. So there, it was, it's kind of an all brick room. And so we brought in mattresses and hung blankets, got in this really nice vocal booth and, and so we had an editor on that record where it was like his, his job was basically to help comp the vocals, edit them. And then I'm working with the band doing overdubs and then he brings them to me and we drop them in. Nice. And so he was, he was working on some vocals and he was like, Hey man, the vocals, I think they could sound better. And me just being in a hurry, I'm like, and thinking he's trying to be lazy. I was like, just, just do it. It's fine. Just do your thing. Um, and so he had its three vocals. And I mean, Chris, the singer had been singing for two days doing harmonies and all this stuff. So he finishes about three songs over the course of three days. A vocal editor who had warned me there was a problem, but I didn't listen to him because I was just head down overdubbing. Yeah. Um, he brings him in and we bring him into the master session in the, in the control room and they don't sound right. <laughs> so I'm like, what's going on here? And he and I are soloing the vocals and like trying to figure it out because we don't want to tell Chris that something bad happened because he's just spent, you know, three days of his life just bearing down and singing his heart out. And we uh, ended up, he was like, it just sounds really phasey and like almost as if the mic's not even in the, like facing the right direction. I was like, oh no. And we went back there and I think it was a uh, Peluso 2247 LE. And we look at it and it was faced the wrong way. It was in backwards, right? In cardioid. And so he sung all these vocals into a mic and the mic was facing the wrong way. Um, and they were just not usable. I mean, maybe some of the BGVs could have been, but they just did not sound right. Yeah. Oh, man, that's such a bummer. I mean, it's, I can't tell you the number of times where I'm like, you know, Lidge, why did you not go out and double check all the mics? I know. You know? And that's that's probably the one of the things, because when you have a band, especially if you have a full band in a studio like like a Nashville session where it's like guitar players getting sounds, bass players playing their amp, let's get drum sounds at the same time and everyone's kind of waiting on you. <clears throat> um, 
like just recently, I realized like, man, the overheads just don't sound right. And we tracked the whole first song and I had just expected the assistant to like, you know, get them close. I'll move them, whatever. Right. Well, one of the mics was facing towards the ceiling and one was faced towards the cymbals. And that's yeah. why it didn't sound right. So we had to redo it. But yeah, I've gotten better about making sure every mic, you know, is it, are both mics padded or is one mic padded or both in cardio weight or not? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I love. I mean, we we really rely on help in the studio. You know, when you're doing bigger sessions, and I find myself relying on interns, and and then I, I talk to them about it, like, oh, I didn't know there were switches on the mic, and I'm like, oh <laughs> yeah. man. And then of course the real oh man is like, Lidge, come on, you should have gone out and looked at the mic yourself. Exactly. At the end of the day, it's going to be on you, so you need to check it. But that's why I like working with um, drummer friends, because or friends, not necessarily drummers people that you've recorded before that know your process because they know you've got a thousand things in your mind and they might say, Hey, the snare mic fell a little bit. Is this right? Yeah. And I'm, and now I'm always like, thank you so much for telling me that. Cause that if I had not seen that and we were in too much of a hurry and the producer, whoever's asking me something and I'm, I'm not prepared for that. It could have slipped through. So, yeah, I think I've had situations where we, you know, we finish a take and then somebody points out, it's like, Oh yeah, that Tom mic fell off like a while ago. I'm like, Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? Exactly. I mean, thanks for telling me, but maybe it would have been good to tell me a little sooner. But the, you know, the other thing that comes to mind, and we talk about this sometimes on the podcast, is um, headphones. That's the other one that's going to bite you in the ass if you don't go check them a lot of times. Oh man, and that is probably my number one thing that I am <clears throat> such a stickler about. I am always sending the assistant out, or I'm running out and checking to make sure there's no extra headphones on. Um, yeah, it's not a Ranch. Just yeah. now, I mean, there was eight headphone boxes between all the different overdub stations, and it was like everybody, like, make sure you pull your headphones out or turn the master volume down because we could ruin takes so fast. Yeah, and and so just to reiterate the the why that's a problem is a lot of times, you know, in pop music, if you're using a guide click or something like that, you've got all these other sounds that are bleeding through the headphones. But even even just a bunch of pairs open that are playing back the the instruments in the room, if there's a vocal mic or some hot mic, it's really going to, you know, create a, a bleed sound into that mic. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I also try to make sure I have some sort of isolation headphones or if, if bands have in-ears, that's such a gift because then you don't have to worry about click bleed or phasey vocals coming through, like a, a vocal bleeding through an acoustic guitar chain if the guitar player has his headphones just cranked. Yeah. So, I mean, it does raise that question, which you, you start, sort of answered there, which is like, what is the easiest way to get everybody to mute their headphones? Um, I guess pulling the headphones out of the jack is a pretty good one. Although sometimes people forget to put it, put the jack back on. Yeah, my, then, my headphone box has little mute switches on this Behringer thing. And sometimes that's an easy, quick way to do it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, but for some reason they did a left and a right mute separately, so you have to hit two buttons. <laughs> I'm like, why? Why? I wonder if that's for when I just had this happen last week. Um, the singer took out his left ear, and I was get, he was uh, wearing in ears, and I was getting click bleed, and I was like, man, how are we getting click bleed? He's wearing in ears, and I realized he had taken it out. Wouldn't that would have been nice to have? That's clever, actually. I do. I put an ear off for singing a lot of times, and I never actually mute the other side. So maybe I should try. Before your band hits the studio, it's smart to have all the songs and notes in one place. But setting up a shared cloud folder can be frustrating. There's always someone in the band who can't seem to log in or wants to use a different platform. Sampley.app makes it easy to add collaborators to a project so that the whole band can upload new songs and make comments before the session. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music. Just upload a voice memo or song and start commenting. Sign up for your free account with two projects now at Sampley.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. Want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, DS, D-Plosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on this podcast episode. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. 
All right, cool. So let's see. Um, where are you now? Are you down in at um at the uh, in in Texas? Um, I'm back. I'm in Oklahoma. I'm actually at my home studio because I have a band um in town this week. Oh, um, sweet! And they're just kind of over there recording themselves while I'm here with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your studio. Um, you know, if are you sitting in it right at this moment, or did you have to turn the studio over to the band? Well, I turned the studio over to the band, but I have a home home set up. Oh, um, right. I see. Yeah. Well, tell us which, about whichever studio you want to tell us about. We, we <laughs> love hearing about it. Like, if you're sitting in your studio and you look around you, what do you see? What's what are what are the tools that you find most useful? Well, okay, that's a great question. Um, I have my Mini Moog Model D, favorite synth of all time. Nice. It's right above my rack to the left because. I use it all the time for noise crashes, for synth bass, but mainly for filtering. Um, what's, mics, a, what's noise crash? What's you know, a noise crash? Like sometimes if you overdub a crash at like the end of a chorus on a pop song, it just sounds fake. Even if you bust it through the same bus, I don't know why. It's just when the kick isn't with a crash, it just yeah. sounds fake. Um, it sounds like uh, Proud to be an American when it's like, Da, da, da. <laughs> it, it just always reminds me of that. It sounds so fake. So a noise crash is just, um, you can take, you know, the oscillators, turn them off and just have the noise oscillator on and then use the filter to get, and turn your sustain up and your decay up and basically get a, and to me, it always sounds better than a real crash. That's if the awesome. music is right. That's awesome. So now I have another question for you too. I actually just got that uh, a Behringer Model D. Does that give me street cred in your view, or do I do I get sent to the corner because I'm in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, as much as I want to be a Behringer hater, I've had so many friends that have gotten the Poly D, the their Model, model D, um, and a lot of the other ones they've been making recently, um, the Pro Two. And they'll bring me stuff and it sounds great. So I can't be a hater. I'm, uh, I think it's very musical stuff. I'm just, I'm having a lot of fun rediscovering synthesizers right now. And the Poly D specifically seems like a really cool one. Um, I mean, one of my friends, I kind of gave him some shit for it when he bought it. And then he brought me a song. And I was like, man, that's a really cool sound. What is that? And he's like, Poly D. And I'm like, oh, of course. And I'm like, that's a cool sound. What's that? And he's like, Poly D. And I'm like, well, okay. I guess the only bad thing it's about real. Poly D is it sounds like a denture cream. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. All right. So, um, uh, groovy. Well, that's cool, man. So you got the, the Model D in front of you, the Moog, and, um, and you're and using I mean, that for crash sounds, which is really cool. I've never heard anybody say that. That, I, and then also for filtering. I mean, the filter in that thing is so... The word that always comes up is chewy. But you can send an anemic mic or a piano mic or something, and it can go from sounding really bad to really good. Um, wow. Or it, it can take a piano and make it sound like a sample, which I love. Um, so what's so a way can, to do that? Like, let's say you've got, um, you know, the Moog. Or do you say Moog or Moog? I mean, it, I say Moog, and then people are always like, what? And then I say Moog, and then someone's like, it's actually Moog. So I... <laughs> It's it's a trap every time. Okay, <laughs> I love it. I just trapped you again. Um, <laughs> but, so now, how how would you set that up, even or whichever synth you're going to use? Um, what would be a typical way to have that available to filter okay. the sound you're doing? Well, let me say this: I'm obsessed with filters, and so I mean, Model Ds have gotten dumb expensive right now, but the Korg MS10, Korg MS20. The Yamaha CS5, which can be found for pretty cheap, Yamaha CS10, and then the Moog pedal with the cursive writing, the cutoff filter. Um, and there's actually a really tiny Korg. Oh man, what's that called? It's like a little filter that's handheld. It looks like a toy, but okay. it has the same filter as the MS10. I'll look it up here in a second. But any of that stuff, plus, you know, the UAD Moog. But what I do is I just, for instance, piano which it always sounds great on. I'll send that out um, channel five, which at my studio comes up five and six, come up to two reamps that are just in the bay, always patched mm. um, or normaled. And 
I'll run that out to the Moog external signal in. And then you have to have a key held down. So I'll just tape a key down or jam a cable between two keys. Um, and then you have uh, control over the drive. And so you can hit the filter really hard if you want distortion. You can not. It, also, it sounds great no matter how you do it. Um, and then you choose, you know, your cutoff point and record that back in. And it's That's cool. Always cool. You know, it reminds me of a, uh, there's a, um, Ross Rice was one of, one of my, it was first producer I got to make a record for. And he was telling a story about a cat who played one of the greatest organ overdubs he'd ever seen. And I forgot the guy's name, but he said the, the entire solo he just took a pencil. He pushed the key down on one note on the organ and stuck a pencil in there, I think, and that kept the key down. And then he just played <laughs> the draw bars for the whole solo. That's pretty great. I, I was reminded of that with you, talking about jamming the, the mm -hmm. key down. Well, so that's super cool. Um, yeah, the, these new Behringer synths I, I've got have uh, you know the ability to filter sounds like that. And I guess, do you find that like even guitar pedals are totally worth doing that to all your sounds and sending it out? Or, or have you found that like some filters really sound remarkably good and other ones are just kind of a waste of time? What would be your take on that? I think it's definitely for me, the latter, um, there's some filters that you run stuff through and it's just, Oh, that's darker. I mean, specifically the mini Moog filter and the Korg MS 10 when they made the MS 20, there's two filters. The early ones have a good filter. The later ones, it's less aggressive. Hmm. Um, but the MS-10 filter is really aggressive, really dirty, super freaking cool. <clears throat> and it can feedback um, with itself when you turn the resonance up so you can get some other cool tones. But those two in particular are really inspiring to me. I also have... Um, Yuri made a filter called the... 565T, and there's a 565 version without a transformer. Um, those are pretty cool. Allison Labs made some that were really cool that, I mean, I found mine for 50 bucks on eBay um, that oh, are bandpass yeah. filters that sound super, like can make a guitar sound really sampled. That's the same. That's Allison Research that did um, the, the Gain Brains and the Keypex gates and all that? I think so, yes. Yeah. And it's like a big green, I mean, it's probably six rack spaces. Wow. <laughs> um, and if you find them on Reverb, they're going to be, you know, 2000 bucks. But if you find them on eBay, it's somebody just selling old gear out of a warehouse and they're going to be 50 bucks. So uh -oh. Bing, rock stars. Yeah. I, uh, I specifically had that moment with that filter where it was like, I found it like, oh man, I'm not going to pay that. And then like, I'll just check eBay that, that old dinosaur eBay and... <laughs> There was 50 bucks. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, keep talking about synths. I don't even know what questions to ask. I just want to hear you talk about <laughs> synthesizers. <laughs> um, okay. Well, my favorites, I have a bunch. I have a, I mean, I have a lot of DX7 ish synths um, because I had a moment where I would love those. I'm currently not in that moment, but I have the DX7, the DX11, the DX21. Are those are all FM synths, frequency modulation. Yeah, they're all like slightly different versions of DX7s, different sizes, different. They're all mono. Um, DX100, the Reface DX, um, the Korg DS8, which is their version, the Korg Kawai, or Kawai K3, which was Kawai's version. Um, and my favorite of all of those is the DX72, DX27. Which is great. You know, it's great because when we talk about gear numbers like that, basically it means that for somebody who's never heard of it, it's meaningless. And for somebody who loves it, it's like, it's an exactly. endorphin hit. <laughs> but um, also, uh, we recently had a, a really fun guest on the show, Moot Booksley, joining us from down in Florida. And he would he would absolutely know every single one of those synth <laughs> models you just listed. Yeah. So yeah, to be less boring, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, the Yamaha CS50 is one of my other favorite synths. Um, and it's like a baby version of the CS80, um, which is a legendary synth, I'm sure most yeah. people have heard of. Yeah. Um, the CS50 is, I think it's basically half of a CS80, and it doesn't have the ribbon controller. Um, but it sounds, every time I plug it in, someone's like, that sounds so human. There's mm. something about it that sounds so alive. 
Um, and it's then it's like course, having a really good guitar, like guitars, you know, a guitar is a guitar, but a really great guitar just sounds great. Dude, exactly. Um, and then, you know, Juno 60, Juno 106, those are staples. Yeah. So let's, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that you find it effective to have these around the studio. So let's, let's just imagine for a minute that any one of us has a collection of cool synths, but then we're like, okay, how do we integrate this effectively into the studio where it's either available easily enough, or but it's also not in the way, but it's also not too much of a pain in the ass to, to use it for something. Um, you know, what are some of the things you've learned? For example, do you ever find yourself like listening to way too many synthesizers to try and find the next overdub, or do you just instinctively go for a particular thing? Well, that's a great question. So for a little bit, I was like, man, I want to wire up my studio where every keyboard's into a mixer and you can play it and whatever. Um, the and ultimate I did setup, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'd seen guys on YouTube and, um, you know, some of the, especially some of the music scoring guys have massive setups. I was like, that seems really cool to get every single keyboard I have out because if not, I won't use it. Long story short, I hated that. I mean, you're standing in the corner of your studio, like on a stool playing a keyboard that's close to the ceiling. Right. <laughs> and it's, it just sucks. And so what I found worked for me is I, um, I have like prime real estate. So mini Moog Model D to my left on top of the rack because it filters and it makes killer bass sounds. It's my favorite synth for bass. Um, and then I have a rack to the right. That's the CS50, a Juno 60, um, and a Kai S1000, which I use for filtering, uh, like sampling. Um, which is a different version of filtering for me. Oh, and the Mellotron, the new Mellotron 4000. But I like being able to grab that keyboard and set it next to me and explore. And I know if I want a wide stereo pad, every time it's going to be Juno. If I want synth bass, Model D. If I want quirky sounds into a chorus, CS50. If I want warm little like roadsy type sounds, it's going to be the Prophet. Five or six, which also live in there. Forgot to mention those, but yeah, I I I try not to spend too much time. Like I think I know my keyboards well enough to know what I reach for for certain sounds. Right. So it's a little bit like getting to know that your you know your hollow body Gibson three thirty five has a sound. Your Tele's one sound. Exactly. Your Strat, your Les Paul, that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes you know you know, we're immersed in this world of like a million options, especially when you get into the software synth space. And it can be a struggle sometimes to figure out like, how do I integrate this? You know, do I need to look at a million sounds to figure out what to do next? Or do I just need one good sound? Exactly. And I mean, I think what I've learned in trying to integrate into my space, when I go to a studio like Sonic Ranch that has a million instruments, and so you're with a band that sounds like I was just there with a the band, Will Dorado. They don't have a bunch of synths in their songs. They might have some Juno 60 on a chorus pad or here and there. But for the most part, it's going to be piano. It's going to be a little bit of Juno, but the rest of it's all guitars. So we go through and we pick out, okay, we might need a hollow body. We might need a telly. And then we basically choose those things and we start the record and that's how we make it. Yeah. So at my studio, I've basically tried to keep, for the most part, all the extra guitars and synths in the other room. And when a band gets there, it's like we kind of choose our flavors. And that 95% of the time is what we're going to dip into. Um, I mean, and the beauty of it is if you want to try something crazy, just go in the other room and grab something crazy. But um, so that we don't have a million options and that we're not just tripping over chords and all that all day long, it's, I think that's a good, healthy way to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great reminder to what you said about, you know, because we're always, always in search of the ultimate setup for our studio. And I feel like your takeaway is a good one. It's like the ultimate setup isn't usually, isn't always so ultimate when we, when we do it, it's, it's simplicity is really effective and, um, you know, choosing the boundaries of whatever you're going to create and our, you know, artistic boundaries. And I'm so glad that I tried that setup and hated it because I kind of like, we'll make revisions to this perfect studio in my head. Like if we bought a house on the country and I built a studio behind the house, this is what it'll look like. And that's what it would have looked like a bunch of keyboards around the room. And now there'll just be a biggest, bigger storage room where I can go in and grab that stuff. 
but I don't want those keyboards set up. And I've, I've talked to friends before, like, I wonder when Peter Gabriel built that huge studio, real world studios. Like, did he ever get in the control room and be like, oh man, like, I wish this was smaller. Yeah. <laughs> we just spent billions of dollars and here you go. Just here's your room. <laughs> I long for my closet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good point. I mean, like even the storage room thing, like even, you know, I tried to set up the guitar amps in the studio recently where I was like, all right, let me at least have all the guitar amps plugged in so that you can plug into one and see which one you like the sound of. And now I'm already second guessing that, you know, <laughs> maybe that's a terrible idea. Well, and I think the great thing about it is I think we just get bored. Um, and when you get bored, you're uninspired. And so if for the next record, it makes sense to have them all plugged in because you know the singer's going to want to hear every single amp, then great. And if the next record, you feel cluttered and uninspired, then move them all out and see what record ends up, what amp becomes the record. And oh, we use this one amp on the whole record. We didn't even touch anything else. That's great, man. That's great advice. So it's not the technique that matters. It's the the inspiration or lack of inspiration that matters. Yeah, it, honestly, it it kind of reminds me of like, uh, for me, like eating healthy and working out and things like that. It's like, you know, at this point in my life, I, I'll have two months where I'm really into it. And it's like, oh, that's boring. I'm uninspired. And then I'll eat like shit and not work out. And like, okay, I want to do that again. <laughs> and so in the studio, I feel like it's like, there's not some magical combination, some magical diet, some magical thing that every time is going to work. It's like, you know what? If I have to rearrange my studio every four months, let's do it. It gets a little expensive sometimes, depending on what rearrangements you're doing. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess I just mean like, you know, let's throw this keyboard in the other room and let's throw this amp in storage and whatnot. Yeah. I, no, I mean, just, I mean, I don't, we don't have to stay on this specific topic for too long, but I remember years ago, you know, hearing about a, a article with the band Air and they were, they were quoted as saying that they would buy instruments that they wanted to use for that record. And then after the record was over, they'd sell them all off and buy something new. I don't know if that was exactly really what they did every time, but it opened my eyes to that idea. It's like, you know, why not? let yourself, I mean, I just did a big changeover in my studio and I let go of an amazing console and switched it out for a a desk, you know, for my computer, but I'm excited about it. I, I just want to be excited about doing some new stuff. Cause as you point out, it's like the inspiration is the most valuable currency you've got in the studio. Yeah, absolutely. I just did a, rec a similar thing recently. We had a Yamaha PM 2000 in front of us and the computer off to the side on a rolling cart. And during COVID, I was just like, you know what, let's just move this and see how it feels. And it feels awesome and just refreshing. So you got just rid moved of the console. It two inches to the left. Oh, okay. Right. We got, yeah, we <laughs> got rid of the console completely. Yeah. The API Select T25 is a classic two-channel FET feedback style compressor limiter with a Class A tube output stage and custom API transformer, allowing split mono or stereo mode. Built with dual triode vacuum tubes, sidechain de-essing, detent controls for accurate recall, and API's famous thrust mode, the T25 represents a new design in tube compression. Bring the legendary sound of API to your home studio studio with the new Select T25 at apiaudio.com. You've already invested in your speakers, headphones, and the sound treatment of your studio. So you're ready to make great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world when they leave the studio. The problem is that the frequency response of your room is not allowing your speakers to tell you the whole story. Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can solve this for you by calibrating your speakers and headphones EQ and balance so that you can now make better mix choices. Start with a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com. Um, well, so you brought up Will Dorado. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, it's, you know, you, you said that you tracked that down at Sonic Ranch, uh, but you also mentioned using a great mic and a really nice um, mic pre and, and a 1176, I think, something like that. And, you know, tell us a little bit about that process or if, you, you know, if that's a particular story you want to share, we'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, I mean, those guys are 
they're a great band. Um, I like working with them. We kind of, I would say there's four, four to five bands that I work with that I just kind of basically become a member during the process. And it's like, I might have a guitar or bass on or be playing keys or whatever. And it's like, we have a good enough, um, camaraderie and rapport within ourselves that it's like, you know, the, the guitar player, like, Hey, why don't you go play keys and let me try this guitar part? Or he might say, Hey, no, I want to try that. And it, it's really fun. But specifically there was a song that we were listening to, um, when we were back at their studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, trying some stuff. And I mean, they have like an SM7 and an Apollo and we are just referencing faces. Ooh, la la for some acoustic guitar sounds. Nice. We tried some stuff and it didn't didn't totally work. And then we get down to Sonic Ranch and um, the assistant at the ranch was like, hey, this new 47 that we got sounds incredible. It's the earliest serial number we have. And he said, we actually have the Telefunk and B-76s, six pre's in this room now that used to be in a different studio, which are some of my favorite pre's when I get to use them. Um, anyways, we... We tried a similar part through the, like we had an SM7 through like a UAD Neve and an Apollo. And then when it was going through like a vintage 47, a V76, and then an 1176 on the compression, it was like, whoa, that sounds like a classic record. And that was, <laughs> I mean, we have these moments where like, I feel like it goes both ways. Like gear doesn't matter. It's more about the room or it's more about the song. And then you have these moments where like, okay, gear can definitely matter for the right kind of thing. Right, the moment it inspires you to. Exactly. And so that chain, we ended up trying vocals on it. Like, let's just see how the vocal sounds through this. <clears throat> because we had tried some different mics. We did a shootout with a 251, an SM5, blah, blah, blah. I could go on. But um, we tried the him just sitting right there and it sounded so freaking incredible. And it's like, well, let's carry that over to the upright piano. And we had, you know, Upright piano was stereo mic'd and had a room mic, and this one mono mic sounded somehow wider and more alive than the whole situation we had before. Carried it to the drums, and it just it was so cool because that became like our chain of like okay, all the percussion we did went through that chain, and it just sounded like a record. It sounded great, and it started out with an acoustic guitar. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, on the second to last day, of course. Yeah, <laughs> after we had you know worked for ten days without discovering that but you know we went back and peppered some stuff over the other songs yeah but i mean maybe a good takeaway too is it's not like you just made that chain up you actually started with something that you needed to do it felt right for that first overdub and then you just said hey let's just keep trying this on other stuff to see what it sounds good and and i you know examples might be like the scratch vocal mic sounds killer on the drums bleeding through or yeah you know, other, some unexpected mic sounds great. Uh, same thing with the piano. I find if there's other mics open in the, in the tracking room, sometimes those sound cool on the piano, a vocal mic particularly. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I love those moments where you, I mean, you kind of just happenstance onto that. It's, it's, it's kind of the fun part of recording again. It reminds you of when you're young and like, oh, wow. Yeah. So is saying the word happenstance. <laughs> this is a good word. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> For all you Brits out there, I've been watching, my girlfriend and I have been watching a BBC show called Miranda. She, she's always like, it's a comedian. <laughs> she's always making fun of words. We're looking for a new show, so maybe we'll check it out. Happenstance. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So let's see. You mentioned using samplers as filters. Tell us about that. I remember when I was in school, we had to learn the S1000, and I thought I was glad that I didn't have to use it anymore, <laughs> but maybe I was wrong. Well, so um, I was talking to Dave Cooley. He's a mastering engineer that I love what he does. And he masters for this band, Broncho. It's band Sports that I work with. And it's funny, he used to be a producer and he um, he switched to only mastering because he said he just got tired of of the producing game. But he, he did some pretty big records. Um, one that comes to mind, he did Lazy Eye for Silver Sun Pickups. I don't know if you remember that song or not. Anyways, um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, no, no, I can hear you. No, I just did. I, I, I was going to say I didn't. Phone. I didn't know that one, but I figured why interject with the no? I don't know yeah. that one. <laughs> I bet. I bet you've heard it. But point is, uh, he's just been around for a long time, and he's not like that much older than I am. He just 
he's got a lot of experience. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'll hit him up and just say, Hey, we're looking for, you know, old school drum sounds on this. We're looking for this. Um, here's a reference. And he's been such a good, um, source for like, Hey, try the S1, the, the old Akai samplers, the 900 or 902. I forget yeah. the model, the 950, the S1000. Um, and so, um, on a couple, couple different projects, um, one, this bronze radio return, the lead singer, Chris and I have some sync projects on the side and, uh, just to try to make things sound quirkier or more real. I say, when I say more real, I mean more like it was on a record. It actually sounds faker probably, but I like to, I like to hear something and feel like, okay, that sound was, it already existed before this song existed, which yeah. it didn't, but you know, um, anyways, he and I kind of discovered it about the same time I was discovering it with this band sports. And what's funny is if you run like a kick drum through it, it doesn't really do anything. But if you take, um, like a whole drum track and a bass track and smush it through the filter, um, it just, it sounds so different and it cuts off the high end, it cuts off the low end and the compression that it does is just not compression you're used to hearing. It sounds super cool. I think it's 32K sampling um, and you can sample for about 38 seconds on the one I have. And so on one of the sports, one of their new tracks, um, I look up the name of the song. Uh, We had to basically since stuff through it in 38 second chunks. So the song's three minutes. So we're just, you know, going back and lining up and Was whatever. That, you are the right one from naked um, all the time. It's not that one. Cause that one's great too. That <laughs> yeah. That one's amazing. That, that one, the drums are bust too. an Atari half inch machine. Oh, sweet. And then let's see another one in the list is manicure. Oh, manicure. I had a, so I have kind of this shelf of dying tape machines that I have this, grand plan of loading all up and taking to Nashville at some point and finding this guy that's like has a love for them and is going to tech them out for me. Yeah. Um, Part of I the have, ultimate studio setup plan. It, exactly. Which I have some tape machines that do work great, but these are kind of like the dying ones. And so I have this PV um, AMR and it's such a cool looking machine. It's all white and manicure was uh, recorded through cassette. Um, and that's what gave that, such a great sound. And then there was a Lindrum at the local music store. And I asked the owner, I was like, how much is this? And he's like, oh man, it's going to be four or 5,000. I was like, can I borrow it for like 20 bucks for like two hours? And he was like, I don't see why not. Nice. So we, we took it to my garage and sampled all the sounds off of it and used all those on manicure specifically. And did you send all those sounds to the cassette as well? Yeah, we did. Um, what's, so let's see, if you're doing this stuff where you're kind of doing cassette, cassettery, cassette trickery on a record, do you find that that stuff integrates really well with sampled programmed things? Or do you also try and use that stuff as part of, you know, a, a live performance of an instrument? Um, well, probably many different ways that I've used it, but I prefer tape machines that are three heads because then you can record right off the repro head while you're recording. Yeah. So you can um, which, hear it while you're doing it. Yeah. So you can hear it while you're doing it as a slap, which can end up just being cool in and of itself, but also so that you can just bump it, you know, a hundred milliseconds or so. And it's in time. Um, otherwise you have to rewind the tape machine, play it back in and then edit by hand. And then you have some phasing issues. And so I only if I have a two-head tape machine like the PV, that's usually only for the final mix. Um, three-head machines get used during the tracking. Yeah, so that was one of the things that I let go of was my analog tape machines too. So I might be in trouble with you at this point. Or maybe you're psyched because you just ended up getting them for your studio. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's some days when I run stuff through tape and I'm like, man, I need to do this all the time. It sounds incredible. And other days where I'm like, this does nothing. I hate it. This takes too much time. So again, I think it's one of those things where there's no rules. It's just whatever inspires you for that particular project. Now, I think you have a JH110, right? One of the Mara machines or something like that. I do. Do you and ever use it. it in the uh, seven and a half Ips mode? Does it do that? 
it does do that. And you know what? I haven't had it that long. Um, I've had it probably six months. Um, it was my 40th birthday present for my wife who killed it Sweet. with that present. Um, she talked to my friends and got it. Um, but yeah, I usually use it in 15 so far um, or very speed. I yeah. love speed, speeding up mixes on it or slowing them down. So, so um, I, I had one and, um, and I, I, you know, one thing I can say, or I think that we can all say about having gear and letting it go is you can feel better about letting it go. If you feel like, you know what, I did, I'm not using it today, but I did use it. Like, yes, yeah, so absolutely. I did use it. I did use it for some pretty cool stuff, but I remember um, trying it out in, at first and it had the seven and a half hips and I just like sent over some bass and drums and I was just like, holy shit, this just sounds like dub. You know, it just sounded <laughs> massive, fat, low end. So I recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try that. And the other thing, I I got it and I had just used an ATR-102 at Sonic Ranch and fell in love with that. It's actually on that Andrew Bell track that I put on that playlist. Um, the drum tracks are going through that. But anyways, nice. so I pulled up the the Mara and I was like, man, this just does not sound that tapey to me for lack of a better term. I know that's super subjective, but so I texted Ryan Hewitt and said, Hey, like any suggestions, tape formulations, whatever. And he said, what are you using? And I said, ATR. And he said, yeah, that's basically not supposed to sound like tape. It's high bias. And he said, order low bias tape. So I got Scotch 250, um, and, uh, PASF 468. And both of those immediately when I put them on, it was like, oh, wow, that's like 80% different. That sounds like actual tape. That's awesome. So that was, uh, that was cool. Yeah. Um, I feel like that was sort of the evolution of tape. They tried to keep making tape sound closer and closer to Pro Tools. <laughs> you know, exactly. Not yeah. exactly, but, but you know, they were trying to get rid of all these artifacts that we've grown to love and we're, we're you know, going back to search for. We did a session um, at Sunset Sound once where we were doing using a bunch of tape. And I think I just talked about this recently on the um, podcast, but we had the opportunity to just kind of, you know, create the ultimate studio setup, which of course didn't work as we've already established. <laughs> yes. And, and in, in my ultimate studio setup in that moment, it was to help us decide which tape formulation to use. We, we aligned every channel on the multi-track differently to different speeds and different, oh, wow. different um, over biases and all kinds of stuff and different, different tape formulations. But it was cool because we arrived at a similar conclusion. We ended up realizing that 15 EPS and 456 tape sounded best to us, you know, sounded better than 30 EPS and, um, you know, using a, a high bias tape. And for rock stars, if you're not... If you don't know what Ips is, it's not a martial arts fighter on Netflix. In this case, it's a speed of the tape, the inches per second. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, it's also fun though. I mean, having those moments at like you had at Sunset Sound, it just reminds you of being 17 again and trying to get a snare sound for three days. So yeah, even if it wasn't maybe as fruitful as you expected, it's like, well, at least I got to nerd out and do nerdy engineer stuff for a little bit. That's, that's kind of how we all started. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with a set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. So 
So you just finished an awesome mix and sent it off to the band, but the singer texts you with lyric changes, the drummer emails you wanting a different fill, and the bass player DMs you on Instagram about a wrong note in the chorus. But which mix version are they talking about anyway? Don't you wish there was an easier way? Samply.app comes to the rescue as your ultimate mix assistant, streaming high quality mixes so your clients can easily listen and send notes from their mobile phone on the road or a computer back in the studio. All mix comments are time-stamped directly onto the correct mix version with no confusion and everything is easy to find in one location. No more mixed up mix messages from the band. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music and it all works in your browser with no downloads required. Sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Chad Copeland, joining us from Oklahoma. Chad, are you ready to uh, jam, my friends? <laughs> I'm ready. All right. Hope you don't mind me throwing a little. You know, I do want to ask you if the the cowboys and the uh, farmers can actually be friends. I've always been curious about that. Well, my parents and wife went to OSU and they are cowboys. So, yes. All right. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> Little little musical reference. I don't know if I don't know if you. I think are you a dad as well? I am. And do you have a, a son or a daughter? Two daughters. Seven Two daughters. Four. All right. So you can understand the the importance of getting to know your musicals. That's something I had to to uh, learn to love. I wasn't a, I wasn't a musical fan growing up, but I've learned a lot more about them. You know, kids around. I've learned to like Disney movies. I don't think I like musicals yet, but <laughs> maybe someday. Give it time, man. Give it time. Um, let's break down the tape thing for the rock stars just a little bit more understanding how to do that. I know, I know, you know, I think we probably both talking about the same way of doing it, but I'd love to hear more specifics about how you would set that up. So let's say the rock stars get a hold of, I don't know, a three head cassette deck, which those are kind of hard to find. So maybe they just find a three head tape machine and well, they want to try it out. You know, what, the, how would they set it up? The Marantz PMD 222 is probably the best, but there's the 221, which I think is mono. Um, those are 150 bucks, 200 bucks on reverb or eBay all day long. And they're incredible. And they're three heads. So, um, but yeah, to set it up, I mean, for instance, um, I love running drum tracks through it and literally just take all your drums. Okay, here's how technical do we want to get here? Pretty technical. Well, I mean, technical and or like, how do you plug everything in? I always find that's really helpful for people. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, depending on the tape machine, I go my reamp out of Pro Tools and some tape machines are RCA in. Some are quarter inch. Um, it's always a pain. You're going to have the wrong cable every time and go to Guitar Center and buy a bunch of adapters. Um, and then I come back out. I usually hit a pre um, just so I can control if I need more gain or if I want to hit the pre really hard and turn down the output of the pre. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, so like if I'm doing a whole drum stem through it, it sounds incredible. Um, you have problems if you want to say send an, a mono overhead mic to tape and then not use okay and then you bring it back into pro tools you record it through your chain you line it up because there's going to be a delay in in the tape head so you right. line it back up in pro tools now you can't for the most part use the original overhead track and the tape track or if you hit it really hard on a kick track you're going to have problems if you use the original so right because they're going to phase out on each other a bit yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have that problem even running stuff through the filter. It's like you have to molt parallel after Pro Tools if you want a non-filtered original track, if that makes sense. I, yeah. won't, I won't go into more detail. But um, but yeah, so like on a kick, it's like I might take the kick in um, and hit it to tape really hard so it gets that real like nice crunch and the kick out I won't touch. You can do that as long as there's two mics. It won't phase that bad. It sounds cool. Um, but yeah, I love it on drums. I love it on bass. This band, Broncho, that I work with, I mean, I think everything gets taped once or twice. Every single channel 
through cassette, through quarter inch, and then the mix goes to half inch or quarter inch at the end. I mean, it's just they want things to sound smaller and different and just, yeah, it's just part of the process. What I like about it on bass and drums specifically is I feel like I'm always fighting low end. And it's like I can turn up the low end and it sounds weird. I can turn it down and it sounds weird. It's like I, I have an issue with like, 60 hertz and below and knowing what to do with it. Um, mm-hmm. And with with tape, I feel like when you hit tape, it just, I mean, it's kind of like a real distressor. It's like compressing harder as it's hitting the tape harder and hitting certain frequencies in different ways. But what I find when I pull that back into Pro Tools, if I have the kick too loud, it sounds like, oh, that kick's really loud. That's cool. Or if I have the kick not loud enough, it's like, oh, the bass is loud, but the kick's kind of quiet. That's cool. Tape gives you like this, almost like a margin of error. Um, and I don't know why, technically. I just mm-hmm. have had that experience multiple times. It's like if you send the vocal through tape and you bring it back in, it's like, oh, that vocal's too loud. That's so cool they decided to do that. Yeah. It's almost like back to your inspiration thing. It's like it doesn't matter. There's no longer a right or wrong answer. It's just if it sounds inspiring to you, now it's good. now it feels good. Exactly. And for some reason with Pro Tools, I don't have that as much. Um, it's like we're doing 0.5 and 0.25, you know, bumps on the volume at the end of the, the mix. And when it's tape, it's yep. like, cool, we're good. Yeah. With Pro Tools, I, I do find myself going to the car and I'm like, oh, I need to make adjustments to these things. And then I go back and I make adjustments and then I come to the car again and I'm like, but I don't like this any better than what I, <laughs> where I was. Yeah. You know, it gets tricky. It's easier to be in a head game that way. Yeah, and those little tweaky level changes, God, they they are so often unsatisfying. Yeah, tell me about it. Level changes, tempo changes, all that kind of stuff that you can just get bogged down. Lyric changes? Do lyric (laughs) changes count? Yes, absolutely. Um, Okay, cool. Well, so let's see. You know, one of the ways that I would use tape it sounds like you're kind of you've got it in pro tools now you're going to come out go to tape and come back in again um another way that that i did it was just malting out of the mic pre and then going to um going to tape and you bounce it off that third head and then come back in on a track in pro tools but mute put it into record but mute it so you don't actually hear the tape until afterwards and then also come in on directly on Pro Tools off the malt so that you you have sort of a track that you hear while you're working. And then after you do a little bit of recording, you just sort of unmute the tape one and get a nice surprise, a nice pleasant surprise. And then you just shift it back in time. Like you yeah, said. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to do it too. I find myself um, usually in a situation where I want to edit first and see what we have. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I... I don't know why I've never done it like that. Maybe I will. Well, I mean, it, it kind of works and it kind of also is, you know, you, now you have twice as many tracks for everything. So it's kind of, it's sort of the ultimate studio setup, you know, it's a little bit <laughs> yeah. like, you're like, wait, why am I doing this? Um, and then also you're not listening to, in my version, you're not hearing the tape while it's happening. So you can kind of sound check it initially, but then you don't see what it sounds like until afterwards. And in your version, you can really set it, set the levels for the sweet spot every time. You know what? I actually, thinking about that, I did do that once working with Third Eye Blind at East West Studios. um, And they wanted to do everything to tape, which um, is super fun. I had never done, but we molted off into Pro Tools so that we could basically build the comps in Pro Tools and make sure that's what we wanted. That's exactly what we did too. (laughs) And then we actually edited the tape, which I'm not sure if you did that too, which is yeah, super fun and takes a long time. I had never done it. And the band was like, okay, we're going to take off. You guys want to throw that together analog. And so I looked at the assistant once the band left and I was like, have you ever done this? And he was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, I've seen it done. I understand the principles of it, but I've never actually sliced the razor through the tape on a, you know, the two track of the, this, big band that I'm pretty, whatever. Yeah, uh, I was just make sure nervous. your fingers out of the way. 
Yeah, exactly. So we watched a few YouTube videos and had the uh, the head tech of the East West come in and he was like, man, you can't really mess it up. And he's like, it's, it's just as easy as you think it is. So we did it. That's great, man. Well, so to continue that geek out, I, I in the pursuit of the ultimate studio setup, which as, as we've established is never the answer, um, we did the same thing where we cut to tape and simultaneously cut oh. to Pro Tools and then did and then I do all the comps in Pro Tools and I had put uh, time code on the tape. So then I went into Pro Tools and I went to every single edit and I matched exactly what the time code was. <laughs> and then I went to all the reels of tape and I found those time code points slowly and then did wow. all the edits. And, and, and I had to, I created a, a spreadsheet for every tape edit. It wasn't a spreadsheet. It was like a piece of paper that had like all these time codes I could write down and edit points. And so then I did a, the first song and I got through it and there were like 30 edits on the tape. In one song, wow! Just for drums, and it was and like were you it, working? It was so insane. Were you working from multiple reels or just one reel? Yeah, multiple reels. So it was like every take was on a different reel or a different place on the reel. <laughs> oh, and that's why I was referring to this whole chart of of um, time codes so that I could go find the exact take and the exact spot where we used like one bar of one drum take or whatever the hell it was. Jeez, yeah, that's intense. And then you know, of course, it didn't end up being a good result and it took us even longer to arrive at that conclusion what do you have any examples like that where it's almost like the more invested you were into the recording the harder it was to pivot away from a really bad idea <laughs> oh man i probably have a hundred um i mean i feel like the the times that i can think of quickly off the top of my head where that happens the most it's either when you're being too precious about the sounds and it's like, well, we've got to make sure we've got it, you know, the vocal on this channel or how do I say that? Like, for instance, if we demo out a song quickly at my studio and then we're in at Sonic Ranch and we want the vocals on the, the 47 and we want this on this and we want this on this. Yeah. I find that if we're being too precious about that, it's not inspiring. But more specifically, um, getting demoitis and not just running with the inspiration. I mean, I'm sure I have much better examples that when I hear myself say this, I'll be like, dude, why didn't you talk about that? But you know. <laughs> Well, I put you on the spot <laughs> there anyway. But um, yeah, so, so uh, you know, in my example, let's just say my worst example of that was, was recording stuff and working so hard on it. And it took us, we spent a year working on it before it finally got bailed on and moved on to a, another another version of it. Oh, you know what? I guess you saying that probably trying to do a record when I was on my old computer, I'd probably still have problems now. I don't know. But trying to do a whole record at 2496 and just fighting the computer the whole way. And the band was the kind of band that wanted, you know, three mics on the guitar amp and stereo rooms and didn't want to commit or print anything down because they wanted the options for later. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> like, I'd say we worked on that record for four months. And then right towards the end, we were just having way too many problems. And we had to commit all these mics and then take it to 2448 just to be able to, to, to not be crashing all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I spent quite a lot of um, time doing 3296. And I don't even know why 32 would be better or different than 24. I just, I just, did something and it turned out well. And I was like, Oh, what did I use on that? Oh, well, that sounded pretty good. But same thing, you know, like trying to work into a record and get into mixing and everything. And then all of a sudden the computer's just choking. And so I've been switching back to just 2448 and, and just trying it. You know, it's like you said, it's like, just try stuff and see if it hits you right. Yeah. And I mean, there's, I feel like I talk to somebody all the time that just changes basically there's different opinions everywhere. I, I remember this guy, I think Mike McCarthy was mixing a song that I'd worked on and he was like, why did you do this at 2448? 44 sounds so much punchier. And then Joe Ciccarelli mixed a song I did at 2488 and he was like, I can't believe you did this at 88. I haven't done anything under 96 in a long, long time. Yeah. And then <laughs> Reed Chippen getting mad at, at me for doing something at 88 and not 20, 2448. So I've just kind of stuck 
24 or 32, 48 for a while now. Sounds like whatever you decide is the right answer. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's right. Um, so the band sports that you recorded, I uh, can't be with you is one of the songs or, or excuse me, can't be what you think is one of the songs in the playlist. That's awesome sounding. Um, I had a couple of notes and questions about it. It, it, my, one of my first thoughts was that it has this really great use of sort of tight, smaller spaces that are more really up close, you know, sounding, um, you know, effects on the vocals, it, you know, it seemed to also like leave more room for a larger reverb to make a statement as more of a special event in the production. Um, and then it had some great distorted, wide background vocals in the chorus. I wondered if you would talk to us a little bit about, you know, how do you think about all that stuff? What are some of your thoughts about, um, you know, like, should everything have the Valhalla played on it when we make records or should we, <laughs> you know, should we be a little more, more thoughtful and creative with our decisions? Well, that is a great plugin, but yeah. Yeah, it um, is. I didn't mean to diss it. It's an no, awesome plugin. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm always trying to think as far as like what can make this record sound. It's two things. It's one, how can I be inspired? And so how can this record keep me inspired and the band inspired and do something different than we've done before? But then also how can it sound different than what other people are doing? Or like, or we'll hear something that we're, we'll hear something classic or older and like, how do we do that? Um, so I think that was three things. I said it was two. Anyways. Might have been. I can't count that high. <laughs> um, the, the cool thing about that song specifically is we track drums and bass um, and piano. And I remember I, I pulled the session back up and we were kind of listening to it. And I was like, man, I, I'm just not super digging the drum sounds. They just sounded really flat and boring. <clears throat> and so something I've started doing, I kind of stumbled upon it on that and have done it a lot since, but is molting the kick and snare um, either out through like a tiny crappy console mm -hmm. that really gives us some cool distortion. Um, in the case of this song in particular, it was a BAE 500 series 1073. Nice. I cranked the low end, cranked the mid range, cranked the high end, and then distorted the crap out of it and turned it down but molted the kick and snare so I could record out of Pro Tools, kick goes out to a molt, comes back in, and the molt also goes to um, mixer, and then the snare does the same thing, goes to a molt, comes back into Pro Tools, and then goes to a mixer, and then that mixer goes to the 1073. Anyways, yeah. um, it's basically like, I, I don't have a console right now, so it's basically an aux synth is what I'm trying to do. Um, and, and this so, is, this is why you're recording the drums or this is afterwards is like a, pre this is after treatment. premix treatment. And I'm listening to them thinking like, man, these are so boring. And the second I pull that like crunchy mic up underneath the kick and snare, it just sounds so much cooler. And then it's like, okay, let's kill the room mics. Let's make this like a dry song. And so then we got a cool bass tone. Um, cause we only had the drums recorded at first to like the demo piano and vocal. Um, so treat the drums. We record the bass, and it's half real bass, half DX7. They kind of switch in and out, depending nice. on who is in the song. And actually, the last chorus is a P bass, because we had an idea at the end, but we changed the bass line. doesn't matter. Um, and then the piano, which was just an old upright at my place with mono mic with a Soyuz, I think. Um, anyway, so we had this thing, and it's like, okay, this sounds a lot cooler, but how do we make this sound classic? And I kept referencing um, Sweetest Thing U2, which... I think it's kind of one of their, like, if you actually listen to that song on monitors, it sounds really dope and really strange. It's like tons of chorus. The vocal sounds like uncompressed and kind of distorted and kind of weird, but like, it's a really strange sounding song when you only listen to it. And so we uh, ran the piano through H3000 and tried to get some liners and try different stuff like that. But we still were like, we still wanted to have a, a different sound. And so I hit up Dave Cooley mastering guy I spoke about earlier um and but he's got an amazing lathe and we're like could you print this on vinyl for us oh nice <laughs> and so and we had about two months until our next session with that band because they had a tour or something um well it was during covid so they didn't have a tour they had something um 
And so he sent us an acetate, which was funny because the record player we tried it on was the acetate was too heavy and the vinyl wouldn't even spin. And so the record store in Norman is a few blocks away from my studio. So we walked down there and we're like, is there any way we can borrow like a vinyl player that it, more heavy duty? Um, and it was funny. The one that they gave us was the one that was actually playing records in the store. And we were like, we can have it back in like. Before your lunch minutes. break is over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, when he printed us the acetate, we sent him, he was like, you have about 22 minutes to do stuff. So we sent that song with the drum soloed, the drums and bass soloed, the drums, bass and piano. Um, and then we sent some other nuggets from other songs like drum fills, little things that we had built, a couple of vocal takes, um, and basically try to get a vinyl of the record we were about to finish, but stuff that we could sample from. And that was a really interesting way to do it. And even like, you know, slowing the record down, different RPMs or playing it backwards or scratching it, different things. It just ended up being really cool. Yeah. Are you a Portishead fan? You know, I am every time I hear them, but I haven't had that moment where I'm driving and listen to them for three hours and fell in love. And I, I will someday. I know I will. I think, I think you need to go explore the stories about how they were doing stuff in the studio as well, because I remember hearing about them doing things like booking out a big studio and having a, a whole string section in there and then recording it with a cassette so they could keep, sample it off the cassette <laughs> and sending stuff out to get records pressed so they could resample it. You know, of course, this is probably, these are probably all the stories that accompanied their their version of the ultimate studio setup. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, which is really funny. But I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, like, like I like to say on the show, like we're allowed to, we can go in all these directions. It's just the experience that counts, you know. <clears throat> I have inevitable. this great. I have this dream of recording a song, getting it mastered, spending like, you know, way too much time on it. And then we play it in the background while the singer like plays acoustic and sings over it. And then we mic him and you can just kind of hear the actual song we recorded like off in the distance, just as like we knew how much time we spent on it. Just kind of funny, but. That's awesome. I'll see if I can talk a band into it someday. All right. That's reminding me of, um, um, oh my goodness, it's been too long, but uh a buddy of mine had an idea for a performance where every instrument was played through a Leslie speaker that was where the horn, the horn I think was pointed directly out at you to start out. And you just start playing the music through and mic it up with a stereo mic. And then you just turn all the Leslie's on all at once and everything's just starts spinning. <laughs> I was like, all I right, think it's cool. a great idea. Cool. I don't know how to do that, but have you ever done the trick where you fake a Leslie? It wasn't it um, John Lennon who did that or something where they would, um, they would take a mic and you stand on a ladder above a guitar speaker and you just spin the 57 Whoa. around the amp instead of spinning the amp. No, I haven't, but I will try that today. I That's haven't tried that yet either, <laughs> but I like it. Fifty years ago, William G. Dilley introduced the world to his revolutionary new dynamics processor, the Model 610 Comp Limiter. A truly unique device, the Model 610 was not only the fastest, cleanest, and quietest of its type, but was also capable of providing completely separate peak limiting and compression functions. Today, Spectra 1964 introduces the Model C610 Comp Limiter, described as the most versatile piece of audio gear you can buy. Great for adding control and power everything from vocals, guitars, and bass to mixing and even mastering, the C610 gives you the same massive sound that rocked legendary studios like Stax, Arden, AdVision, a and and Record Plant. I'm using the C610 on every record I make at the Toy Box studio, and you should too. You'll love it. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. OWC now brings you the MiniStack STX, the world's first Thunderbolt 4 certified storage and hub expander, perfectly sized to stack with the Mac Mini, and the ideal storage and connectivity companion for Thunderbolt or USB equipped computers and devices. With the SATA HDD SSD bay and NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, you can expand your Mini's storage capacity to gigantic proportions. Three Thunderbolt USB C ports enable 
enable you to connect to millions of Thunderbolt, USB, and future USB 4 drives, displays, AV mixers, cameras, and tablets, as well as desktop accessories like a keyboard, card reader, or mouse. I'm using the Mini Stack STX paired with my Mac Mini M1 to house my dedicated audio SSD and sample libraries at my studio, and it works great. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at MacSales.com slash Rockstars. Um, all right, one more trick. Um, have you ever tried the one where you take two jam boxes with cassettes in it and you put the music on one of them um, or spoken word, you know, voice or something like that, and then you play it across the room and record it on the other, and then you play that one back and you just go back and forth across the room until the sound devolves into nothing but the room tones, just kind of warping and morphing, and you end up with this... It sounds like, you know, like alien dolphins landed in your <laughs> swimming pool or something like that. <laughs> no, but I love all of these ideas. All right, all right. I need you to send me a list of uh, tricks like this to try. All right, all right. You know, I, I've been collecting. I got to remember to try them all, but I but I definitely collect them as I hear them. Um, all right, well, so let's see. That That's awesome, man. So you guys resampled the acetate back in. How did you... give us the Give us the how-to for actually reintegrating that acetate back into the the product you know the 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 song did like the drums get totally recreated from the acetate sample or do you sort of mix and match like what's a clever way for us to think about this um so what we did on that song in particular was the the acetates just sounded like slightly smaller but in a very cool way and we kept having problems with the chorus not feeling quite big enough so we're like, well, why don't we use that for the intro verse bridge and the chorus will go back to the original s- sample. So oh, yeah, cool. we sampled it back into Pro Tools. It's a stereo track of the piano, bass, and drums all playing together because that's what sounded the coolest. Um, and then on the chorus, it actually opens up to the original Pro Tools tracks. And it's pretty subtle when you listen to it, but I, I do think it is super cool. It's a great story. And it's a reminder, too, that when we do these things in the studio, um, we're not always looking for more. It's not like it's not like everything we create needs to be, sound like more than what we just had. Sometimes it's like the secret is to find something that's cool, but a little bit less so that you have some place to go to. You know, you can go to 11. Yeah, that's a good point. Arrives, you know? <laughs> um, now, there was another one you mentioned about the um, bra. Uh, Bronco or Broncho record? Broncho. Yeah, Broncho, where you were using a VHS. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I mean, similar stories to all these. I mean, I, you can pretty much nail down my process after all these stories. But again, we had a day at Sonic Ranch that we had booked in a different studio that had the tape set up already where it's patched in from Pro Tools 24 outs from Pro Tools 24 ends into tape. Back to Pro Tools. Um, and they also had a VHS sitting there. And I was like, why don't we just get this massive, speaking of ultimate studio setup, this was like a massive like printing setup. So we got like the H3000, um, a plate, um, a 201, a 301, a 501, which are all different versions of the same rolling tape echo. Um, some with reverb, some without. Um, I think we used an Ursa space station, whatever. We had like, probably 48 channels come back to Pro Tools, which was the 1 through 24 on the tape machine, and then some stereo effects. But when we were searching for stuff, like, let's just, let's use every channel we can, because we're just printing these entire songs to the tape machine and back end. So like vocals always on channel 21 on the tape machine, so we'll patch 21 into these certain effects, whatever. Mm -hmm. Kick and snare, we're on... I think we had to put the kick farther in because when it's on track one, it was really thin. So we tracked it on like track four. Anyways. Um, we have lovely features of tape. Trying exactly. to shoot, decide which track you're going to use. Um, but yeah, so we found a, v- a VHS recorder. And when we sent the drums through it, it just sounded so freaking cool. And what's funny, um, I have looked for a working VHS, and I know this sounds really stupid because I could probably get on one hand about five minutes and find one, but I've I've got re-inspired by wanting to use VHS and looked 
And I think I've bought six or seven VHS players in Norman and none of them have worked <laughs> from like pawn shops and whatever. Oh God, I think I just got rid of mine too. So I'll, uh, I'll have to get on eBay and just buy a better one, but it sounds super cool. Well, mine ended up at the local Goodwill if it if it's anywhere. So I know you know it's funny. I never even thought about that. Never even occurred to me that the old VHS um, player, which was also a recorder, I had, I could have just used it to treat the audio stuff. Well, some won't let you record audio without video, which I'm sure you could be creative uh, and trick it. Right, because it, it doesn't necessarily have an audio in, or I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. but if it has the yellow, red, white, yellow's video obviously. Um, and some of them will let you record even if it's not seen in a video signal. So I think of the seven I bought, I think three were that problem and like four just straight up didn't work. <laughs> but I, uh, I challenge anyone to go find one and get it to work. And it sounds cool. Very cool. Um, Including and challenging of, myself to find a working one. And then of course, just cass cassette decks, old cassette decks, even if they're not three head, you know, we can... Uh, it's totally worth experimenting with just sending sounds to them and then bringing them back in and you can always Absolutely. line it up again, you know? Um, and I guess it's just, you know, maybe you give yourself permission. It's not like you're going to stop the, the band in the middle of a take to do this kind of stuff. It's more like you give yourself permission to go in and like for, for a half day to day or for these hours, I'm just going to run stuff through a bunch of stuff and see what it sounds like and take it back into Pro Tools and then come back to it later and, and just kind of filter through to see what was cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you find the bands that think that stuff is cool and see the worth in it and the value and you find the bands that don't. And I think it makes it way more fun when the band, if you're going to do it, if the band enjoys that process, doing it with them. So we don't force the bands that hate it to accept... Exactly. New process. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I mean, if there's like one sound, you're like, oh, I bet this would be so cool. I mean, yeah, go do it and show it to the band later or the artist, whatever. But yeah, like sports, those guys are specifically them and Broncho are so into the idea of these kind of recording techniques. And so it makes it easy because it's like, hey, what if tomorrow we do this? And they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds amazing. Whereas a band like Will Dorado, also some of my best friends, insert any band into that they're just like yeah we don't get it like let's just go make songs and make music and that's just as valuable but it's it's all it's just recording it's different every day that's why i think we like it yeah well here's another one that, that i remember a buddy of mine um showing off a long time ago where he took a micro cassette and he would play the vocal out in the control room they just record on a handheld micro cassette recorder, just like go up near the left speaker and just kind of move it around outside of the speaker and then maybe do it again on the right side. And then you just put those back in and pan them left and right with your vocal. And now you've got this kind of phasing, freaked out, you know, effect to accompany a vocal track or any other track. And I yeah. got to remember to do that. I, I haven't done that in a while. That's super cool. On a... Uh... The Sufjan Stevens record, Carrie and Lowell. Um, Jared and I worked on that in Norman. He came out here for a couple of weeks, which if you're not familiar with that record, it's super cool. Um, anyways, we did a lot of iPhone miking while we were recording nicer mics. Nice. And then we'd, we'd pull it into the session. And so there might be an intro that's on acoustic or a vocal that is just the iPhone mic. But, you know, when you get it in Pro Tools and you can kind of like soften it up a little bit. It sounds great. Yeah. I need to just remember to try that where it's like, whatever I'm recording, just throw the voice memo app on the iPhone and like set it down somewhere nearby and then just bring that in afterwards and see what it does. And on that note, I feel like just as cool are like the small tape cassette tape recorders. Yeah. For, for me, I use the Marantz for this because it's battery powered. It makes it super easy, but really, I mean, any of those you could find for 10 or $20 at pawn shops. But if you set that on the floor, Tom, and you're doing drums, it's like the coolest mono room mic ever. Nice. So it's it's picking up some of the resonance of the floor, Tom, as well? Yeah. I mean... Or it's I, just a good I, location. It's just a good location. Yeah. I mean, you could set it on your lap if you weren't using the kick drum. But um, that being said, I was thinking about, like, when I was thinking about this interview, 
I was talking to a friend and telling him we were doing it. And he was like, I feel like it would be nice to be able to say the piece of gear that you use that's cheap, that is the most inspiring. And I feel like we've been talking about these little cassette machines. And I'm not trying to take over your job here, <laughs> but no, no. an easy segue. Uh, when I'm doing drums and percussion specifically, speaking of like an awesome mono mic, the Altec 1220 console is such a game changer. Um, it's an eight, no, 10 channel console. I think I found this one for 150 bucks. Actually, Jared found it and he brought it in and was like, hey, this has spring reverb and a compressor on the master. We should try it. Wow. We did. The compression is after the reverb and it's so cool. So then I bought one and then Craig Alvin heard it. He bought one. Then Re Ryan Hewitt heard it. He bought one. Reed Shippen was mixing a song for me and he was like, what is on that percussion track? I told him about it and he was talking to his tech trying to maybe build something like it. Um, they are so dope and such a game changer. And I think that's one moment in the studio where it was like, man, this is such a sound and it's a sound that I use all the time. And I think it's changed the way my record sound Jared uses all the time. I mean, a lot of those guys fell in love with it. That's cool. I, you know, I wonder if somebody's going to discover, you know, there's all these little mixers that have digital effects built into them. I'm wondering who, you know, who's going to reinvent the new sound that will be super amazing 10 years from now too, where it's using that, um, just, just the digital effects that are built into some, you know, some little mixer. But yeah. I mean, the, what you're mentioning about putting the effect before the compression too, that's a really, really great feature. Um, and can really make stuff sound fun and exciting, you know? <clears throat> well, yeah, the Celtic mixer, it's a spring reverb. And the way that the compression just smushes it. Like when I make a plug-in chain for a mono mic, if I don't have the Altec around and I can't record it, um, I usually use like the Galaxy, the UAD Galaxy, or um, there's the new Arteria 636 spring reverb that's really great. I mean, there's a lot of great ones out there. Um, Cherry Audio makes uh, Roland Tape Echo. That's so money. It's my favorite plugin right, right that, now. Yeah. yeah, they make some cool stuff. Um, but you put that first, and then you put like a heavy, thick compressor after it. So like a, like a kind of slower-ish compressor, like a Fairchild, but on a faster setting. Even 1176 sounds cool. But I, I say that to say that's a pretty applicable thing for some people listening, if they're trying to, like if they have a mono mic and it sounds like way too much high end and it's kind of hard to use, it's like try throwing spring reverb on it at like a 30% mix and then just squashing the hell out of it. Yeah, good, good advice. The first rule of mixing is make good mix choices. To do that, you need to be able to hear your music clearly and accurately. Can you imagine trying to paint a masterpiece while wearing rose-colored glasses or choosing spices for a new recipe with no sense of taste or smell? You would blindly guess with every brush stroke or think that your cooking is amazing when actually it's terrible. That's how it feels to mix when the frequency response of your room is impacting the sound of your music. Even after after you carefully position your speakers and sound treat your room, you're probably not getting an accurate sound at your mix position. The frequencies in your room can have huge peaks and valleys that are completely screwing up your perspective. This is where Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can help you with the affordable solution for calibrating EQ and balance of your speakers and headphones to give you an accurate flat frequency response. By helping you to hear your music clearly, you can now start to get your mixes right. Get a 21-day free trial at sonarworks.com. The API Select T12 is a two-channel, all-tube, Class A microphone preamp designed with API's proprietary AP2516 transformer on the input stage and a custom API transformer on the output stage. Built with the 12 AT7WC and 12BH7 dual triode vacuum tubes, the T12 represents a new and exciting variation on API's classic preamp technology and provides you with unique tonal options for your studio. 
Studio, handling a wide range of recording applications, including stereo operation. Carefully engineered to provide classic tube performance and sound, the T12 brings you API's famous warmth, punch, and clarity in a new design, including a five-year warranty. Check out the new T12 Tube Mic Pre and T25 Tube Compressor at apiaudio.com. Um, all right, so I want to talk to you about one of the uh, records that you've mentioned too, Andrew Bell. Um, you mentioned getting into the modular world, East Coast and West Coast style. And um, that record really has some cool, uh, you know, I guess they're modular synth sounds for drums and bass and blips and bleeps and stuff like that. Talk a little bit about that process or, or just share any good stories about all that. Um, okay, so I stumbled into... Um, okay, I'm going to get this backwards. West Coast is Bukla, East Coast is Mug, right? I don't know. I don't know. They're all good. They're, they're, all, <laughs> they're all good. The Gold Coast okay. for me. I don't know. <laughs> so you, like the, the larger uh, modular rigs that are the Moog modules um, is kind of one school of thought. And then the Bukla, the 500 series, the Euro Rack, that's the other. Yeah. Um, and I think that's West Coast. I'm just a blank mind right now anyways um what's cool is like i was kind of getting into both at the same time and kind of stumbled into some modular pieces and it was all of like the big mode modular stuff and you can take like three or four oscillators and have them even if they're all at the same octave they just sound massive if you slightly detune them yeah. one's a sine wave one's a square wave one's this um and then add some you know, you can add in the noise after the filter, before the filter, whatever. It sounds super cool. A friend got me into some of the West Coast modular stuff too, um, specifically a module called the Morphogene, made by Make Noise. Um, and so, yeah, you can basically take. It's supposed to sound like a tape splice loop. I kind of just use it as like a stumbling piece, where it's like you can record a vocal phrase into it. Um, and then you have got some different parameters and you clock it to um, you can clock it to MIDI, you can clock it to the BPM, you can do it however you want. I did it to the BPM of the song. And you just get these little cool nuggets that'll they can go up an octave, they can come down. And it's just a really um, I guess I would call it just a random music maker because no one else is gonna get the sound that you just got. It can be frustrating because you can spend 30 minutes with it and get just total shit <laughs> and nothing usable or you can spend 30 minutes with it and get like the hook of the song and this little sound that you will never make again but no one else will either yeah which is kind of the fun thing about it because it's not like you know you pull up like a soft synth and it's like oh well there's 65 other people using this exact same sound at this right, moment right? right um so i think that even if just for the romantic part of like this is a sound that we'll never be able to make again it's cool um, but it is inspiring. And once you kind of learn how to manipulate it a little bit, um, it's super cool. And so for that record, it made a lot of sense because Drew is really about being original. Um, I mean, he has his influences for sure, but he wants every sound to be thought about. And so he was really into that idea. And so we, with him, similar to me saying how sports is into tape. And so that's something we got really into samplers and tape and filters. Drew was really into like, let's create sounds that no one has made before. Um, so with the modular rigs, you can make a pad that no one's made before. You can make these little hooks, you can make sounds, all kinds of blips. And we would sample stuff just in the room on the iPhone of us talking and then run it through there. And, you know, it degrades enough that it ends up just sounding like this little noise loop, but it's super cool when you just kind of fade it in the last chorus. Or What's, what are some other good tips about, you know, workflow process? So like, this is more, this is less of a band playing together, and this is more of a one brick at a time production, right? Where you're Absolutely. assembling the music. And do you find that it's important to like, like, do you just sort of go through a creating lots of stuff moment and then sift through it to keep the very best? Or do you very carefully decide you need a pad and you just, you just look for that one perfect pad and then record it and you're done? Like, any thoughts on that, that sort it's of workflow? It's more that specifically with him. Um, we kind of talk, he'll have a demo and we'll talk through the demo and say, okay, we love these parts, but let's beat these sounds. 
And then I'll say, and then I think the last chorus or the second verse, we can kind of shift and do something different. But so like for the, on that playlist, um, that Andrew Bell song, um, he had a drum loop that he had just gotten off Splice. And he's like, I want to remake this because I don't want it to be Splice. And so we basically spent two days and Nathan Price, an incredible drummer, a great friend of mine, he came with us um, and we did this portion of the record at Sonic Ranch. Um, and we just got different drums and we'd hit them and we would just, you know, slam through an Eve pre and get this cool distortion. And that would be the attack of the drum, but there's not body. So let's get a different drum and hit it this way. But it sounds too much attack. So we run it through a mug filter. And we probably got like 20 sounds that we sat and just all three of us kind of went through and moved around and basically made a really, um, uh, we used organic sounds to make a loop that doesn't sound organic to me. It's kind of a weird mix of, um, you don't know what it is making mm -hmm. these sounds. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like, okay, this is, this feels pretty good, but it's not super pleasing. And there was an ATR 102 that was just patched in that we were running stuff through all the time. And when we hit that the right way and squashed it just enough, it was like, okay, that is the base of this song. And so everything else we added over the top of that. And that was kind of like this, we knew that that was magic. It was like this, beautiful squishy awesome drum loop and that's honestly that's another time when taking the time to do all that paid off because sometimes you can spend two days making a sound and it's like man the demo was cooler or let's just let's just record a kit and that can be a little disheartening but that was one of those moments that was like we spent the time and we're freaking proud of how this sounds. Now, do you like to keep a demo close at hand so you keep checking yourself against it like a benchmark? Uh, I don't. I like to throw it out the window and like move um, on. Move on. Yeah. But I, a lot of artists like to keep it around and like, hey, can we just pull the demo up and make sure we beat it? And that's always like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> and if you beat it, it's such a good feeling. And if you didn't, it's you know, it's just sucks the air out of the room. But you know, yeah. it's just it's part of it. I, I used to be more emotional. I think when I made records, and at this point, it's like we're all on the same team, and I'm just helping you facilitate your ideas while bringing my own and being invested, but not so invested that I emotionally get in your way. It's a tricky thing. I mean, you know, it's like, how do you be invested enough that you really care, but not enough that you get angry when they don't like your part or, you know, and I think that's just doing it for a long time and getting older and just chilling out. Nice. Um, so back down at the Sonic Ranch, um, have you been there before? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. No, I'd love to check it out. You gotta love go. To have you have you heard of it or? Know yes, about it? yeah, but I don't know much about it at all. So you can, I, if you want to, just tell us more about that studio right now. That'd be great. Yeah, so it's like um, this guy Tony owns a pecan farm. It's forty five miles away from El Paso. It's on the border with Mexico, and the border fence actually ends on the property. Wow, um, which is super cool. And I mean. Were you guys about, tempted to defect <laughs> to Mexico while you were there? No, but you can. So the border is, it's like the pecan trees are really tall. I mean, tallish. And he said they had a lot of people crossing because it's like the only cover for miles because it's all short mesquite brush everywhere else. Um, and so they built the fence. And then as the trees get shorter and younger on the fence ends, but you can go to where the fence ends and look over to Mexico and the border patrol usually comes up to check on you. And I mean, talk about a complex situation. They understand it way better yeah. than any of us. And right. I'm totally. not going to even go there, but it's, it's interesting to be down there and see the issues that the people that live down there deal with and how they, the respect they have for both sides. And, you know, some of the people that work at the ranch on the pecan farm and even in the kitchen for the studio, I mean, they cross every day. Um, and they have stories and it's, it's fascinating. Um, but so there's four main studios, all incredible. Um, three of the rooms have Neves. One is an 80, ch 80 channel. One is a 56 channel. Um, the other room has a 48 channel, 8068, and then an API legacy, um, which is funny because the API they bought, they just switched it out. They had an SSL. Craig Alvin had told me about this mythical console in Portland at Supernatural Sound. And I was his favorite console to mix through. And someday we got to go up there and do a record. 
And then Sonic Ranch bought a console and they were like, yeah, we got it from this studio called Supernatural. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. I've always wanted to see this because Craig has told me about this unicorn console. Um, but yeah, all of their gear, I mean, they have they have a tech on staff full time and they always fly people in if they need extra help. That's Everything cool. works. They have a massive collection of microphones. I, I've never worked at Blackbird. I've rented from there and been by there. It's probably the second biggest collection outside of Blackbird. But what's cool about it is the day rate is, you know, whatever you negotiate with them, but you get all of these mics with it. So I've been to studios in Seattle where it's like, well, we have a 47, but you have to pay extra for that. Um, at Sonic Ranch, I mean, last week we had two M50s, an M49, 367s, two 251s, C12s. I mean, these classic microphones where each one has a story and you just get to use them for you know, your record. And it's kind of fascinating, especially for me being a gear nut, probably for you too. Um, it's like, mm -hmm. there's not a studio in the world that you could have that many classic microphones set up and it'd be somewhat affordable. Um, beautiful rooms that you stay in, awesome food that these ladies cook every day. I mean, I just can't say enough good things about it. I, I pretty much plan every record at some point to go down there. That sounds super some of the gear. fun. I've got a lot of keyboards and guitars and things at my studio. And so usually I'll drive and bring some things, but you could show up with nothing and they have fantastic acoustics. I mean, I could list things for days, but I mean, if you check out their website, it'll list everything out. It's well, incredible. That's cool. And I, I think you were mentioning having recorded Will Dorado a bunch down there. And um, one of the songs in the playlist outside my head you know, I'd made a note that it just had great sounding drums, real great rock band sound, um, and also a really nice effect on the on the drums, on the snare head, just this nice kind of splash verb going on. But the thing that stuck that struck me as a question I wanted to ask was, you know, you get to the, toward the outro of the song, and you've got these, you know, the song builds like a new guitar line comes in, and then another new guitar line comes in, and somehow you effectively create this feel of layering but it doesn't ever get too crowded it's and so i wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about either production or mixing and how you make room for like you know putting on a new part a new you know counter melody and stuff like that um maybe by making room for it by th having things disappear or by filtering or just anything you want to say about that kind of process of adding more to to a song well, first thing I'll say is that Ryan Hewitt makes that song and he's a total badass. And having him on that record, I mean, when we found out he could mix it and we, we figured out the budget and everything got approved, it was just like, I was so stoked. Nice. Um, but, and so yeah, part of that's him just being awesome. But I would say this is a lesson I'm I learned. There's two lessons I learned over and over again. It's don't too much, don't put too much stuff in a song and know when to stop and, and rest. And mm -hmm. I feel like we've, we've all heard that one for sure. But I mean, how many times have you heard something that you think sounds amazing and you listen to it and it's like, okay, well, there's one guitar part, one bass part, drums and a vocal, or maybe it's just keys, drums and a vocal, w whatever it is. It's like my favorite moments of songs usually aren't when there's 64 tracks or 120. It's when there's, you know, four things that are happening that all sound killer. Um, which there's more than that in this song, but <laughs> uh, it's the lesson I try to learn over and over. So with that song in particular, I think we had bigger guitars in the chorus and it was like, let's go back to the demo guitars, which was, was just a silver tone direct. Um, and then a distorted acoustic doubling it. Um, and that, that song, we, we co-wrote that song. So I had made that track and played that silver tone part. And then the guitar player played the line for the band. He's a good friend. Point is, uh, more so than just that song, I think the lesson is always like, how do we make this sound big, but do it with the least amount of things? Um, and that record in particular, we did at my studio. And we were trying to think like, how do we step up the sound for Will Dorado. And it sounds like the same band, the same people, but it just sounds different because we know we can make that record again. And it's like, let's go to a bigger space and try not doubling guitars and try not, you know, doing the, just do let, do more with less, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. A, yeah. 
in way too long of a way. Well, I mean, you know, and I, sometimes I think it, you know, maybe it's okay to like put a bunch of melodic ideas down and then just don't be afraid to go in with a a scalpel, a hatchet or whatever, and just, um, and just like, okay, have this one go for, for here and then just mute it. Now it goes over to this one and, you know, sort of reassembling, like deconstructing all these melodies. And that was great about this new record because there was a co-producer, one of my good friends, drummer, James McAllister, who also is a multi-instrumentalist, who side note you should have on the show. He's really interesting. Um, Done. he's, he tours with the national as a double drummer right now. Um, but he's done some really great stuff. But he was instrumental in the new record because I had demoed out these songs with the band. And then he could come in and say, like, I would be like, well, what about this melody? And the guitar player might be, oh, that's my favorite. And I'm like, well, that's my favorite. And James, coming in fresh, can just be like, no, meet both of those. Let's do this. And so it's nice to have people you trust and um, can bounce stuff off of. Even if they're not co-producing, I will send bounces. Let me back up one second. Sure. I used to never, never bounce songs I was working on because I didn't want to hear these uninspiring versions of the song until I had all my ideas on there. But now I try to bounce as many times as I can and listen to it in the car on the way home when I'm in a different headspace, listen on the way back to the studio, maybe after coffee, um, and not obsess over it, but just try to hear the song for how someone else would hear it. Mm-hmm. And I was working on a record that Steve Lillywhite was producing in New York. And I remember before that, I never bounced things. I never wanted to hear it outside of the studio. And every night he would burn a CD. <laughs> um, and I mean, that was 10 years ago. Uh, and pass it around to everybody and just say, hey, check this out tonight. If you have anything that you feel about it or whatever, just let me know tomorrow. And that's when I was like, oh, I don't have to do it this way. I could listen and I don't, I know that it's not done, so... It's, I don't have to be precious about it. And and I think those are the moments you can think like, oh man, we recorded it too slow or we have too much stuff going on or these drums sound awesome or they're not right. And it allows you to kind of hear the song as a listener would hear it, I think a little bit more. And especially before you get too deep into it and you're at mix and you've heard it 6,000 times and you, you're just like, I don't know what to do with this anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. We're coming up near the end here, but I got a question from one of the rock stars. Um, this one comes in from Chaz Root. What up, Chaz? Um, he listened to your playlist, which I shared in our Facebook group. So, rock stars, if you're not in there, um, go to Recording Studio Rock Stars Facebook group and join us so you can chat and interact. It's an awesome place. But Chaz, Chaz said um, that you've got a sound, a great sound that runs through all of the tracks in the playlist, really smooth with the tamed high end. And also a bit of smokiness or graininess, which I think, you know, comes from all those things we were talking about. And he said, makes me wonder if he prints through common mix bus settings on all of these songs. Okay, what's on his mix bus and how is he printing these mixes? So what do you want to say about mix bus? Because we haven't talked about that yet. Let me pull up the playlist. So I can... I mean, yeah, yeah, so Ryan makes that Will Dorado song. Right. Um, I think I mixed. Yeah, maybe part of the answer is that it's just it's preemptive because of the way you're 
taking all this time to treat these songs and sounds before it gets to mix bus. Yeah, so I mixed probably seven or eight of these. Um, Ryan mixed three of them, and some other guys mixed a couple others. But I would say a lot of that's treatment. Um, I am always obsessing over my mix bus and changing it. Currently, um, it's a Neve 33609. Um, it's like one revision ago. Um, That's a good one. Yeah, the what's that one called? The N Discrete. Um, it's not the Japanese Neve one, the JN. Um, it's not original because those are like $13,000 right now. Um, and then from there, I hit uh, two Tube Tech PE one C's. It's the Tube Tech full text. Um, and then one of my favorite pieces of gear, the Animod ATS one, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. There's that's super like cool. an analog um, analog tape emulator, right? In a box. Yeah, yeah. And it has. Um, I'm looking at it right now because it's currently at my house in my home studio because I've been mixing here. It has an M79 machine type. 800 Ampex 351 and ATR 102 and then some different tape formulas. What's cool about that is they all react differently. Some have more low end, some have less and you can just kind of like quickly switch back and forth and be like, okay, that sounds magic for this song. Nice. Um, and then from there, there's a stereo widener called the SIP um, stereo image parallel processor that I just add a touch of widening. I don't want to get in trouble by a mastering guy and say, it's too wide, I can't do anything. Um, but every time I use it, bands are like, whoa, that sounds so much better. That's cool. Um, and I learned about that from Reed Shippen. Um, but yeah, so that's my main mix bus. And usually what I do is I'll send the band like, okay, here's my Pro Tools mix bus, which um, is pretty similar. It's like a... Uh, yeah, I build a, a pretty similar mix bus in Pro Tools. Um, and then I'll turn most of those off, unless one of them is just instrumental to the sound. I'll hit, hit that through the outboard. I'll print Pro Tools mix bus, outboard mix bus, and then I'll hit tape, usually with the outboard mix bus settings, um, into the tape machine. And I'll send them all three. And then we kind of discuss, like, okay, we like these two outboard, these two tape, this one Pro Tools. Um, some people don't want to hear that many options, so I don't even give them the option. I just choose what I like. Yeah. Um, but a lot of bands are really involved and they like to be a part of that. Um, but I will say on Mixbus, one of my favorite plugins, I use it all the time, is the Studer A800 from UAD. And if you start messing with the input versus your input knob, how hard you're hitting it, versus the bias and the EQ, it's one of my favorite high-end EQs. One of my favorite saturations is you turn the bias low and you turn up the input. And it can get out of control real fast and the vocals can get really SC. And so sometimes I'll run the vocals at a different output and skip the, the suitor. Hmm. Um, but sports specifically, most of their songs, they're just crushing that plugin. And if you take it off, it gets really woofy. It, it just naturally like... I mean, it carves out a lot of 300. It gives you kind of a smiley face setting, but it does it in such a way that is so vibey. And I'm not staring at an EQ, looking at what it's doing. I'm just listening. And I really like that about it. Yeah. Yeah. I love not having to um, choose the settings on a piece of gear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. Um, so you mentioned a pair of the PE1C tube techs. I think those are, those are like pull textile EQs. Is that what they are? Yeah. And it's um, just a, how do we, how, a high end bump. Yeah. How do we, how do we approach that? If we want to mess, maybe we've got some other version, maybe we got those, maybe we got plugins and we want to experiment with that whole kind of mixing through the poll tech thing. What, what are the settings that we might want to start experimenting with as far as the high and low end? Um, I, I go back and forth between 60 and a hundred on the low end. And I mean, a lot of times I'll do this with a poll tech plugin in pro tools um, and that's boosting a little bit at those frequencies. Usually boosting. Sometimes I do the little like boost attenuate pull tech trick that people talk about. Cause you get a little, little bump at, at 60 and then it rolls off below that. If you have them both at like one or two, 
Um, high end, I mean, usually just a little kick. I mean, I feel like even when the pull techs are in and it's hitting the transformers and the tubes and whatever, whatever else magic is in there, even if you're not boosting anything, it just kind of tightens up the low end a little bit. Um, and I would say 80% of the time, I have a little bump on the high end at 10, cues all the way wide, and a little bump at 100. But sometimes you pop them out and it's like, okay, that's better. But 80% of the time, I think it's better in. If you were experimenting with different plug-in versions of that, would you do basically similar settings as a starting place? Yeah, usually so. There's also the... Um, if I have a really pop mix, um, if I have a big pop mix, a lot of times I'll just pull up several different EQ options. Um, the Plugin Alliance Better Maker, it can be nuts, but it can be really cool. That's um, cool. So yeah, um, one plugin that's crazy but can be pretty cool is the Alicia um, Mastering plugin. And it, it gets a little tricky with the MS settings, but some of the presets in there are so dope um, and they'll sound really good on drums, but they won't sound good on vocals. So then I end up making some oxes um, to bypass certain instruments. Um, another one is the uh, Bax, the Dangerous Bax Master, a preset mm -hmm. called Rich Loudness and Perfect Mix at 48K is another one that I try sometimes. And, you know, sometimes these work and sometimes they don't. And similar with multiband, I'll, I'll kind of cycle through some presets and just be like, am I listening to this? Like, I, it's nice to listen to presets and just be like, okay, let's just throw something crazy on it and just, okay, that's better or worse, better or worse, better or worse. Right. Um, the Fab Filter multiband being one of those. Yeah, that's cool. Um, that's cool. But yeah, it, and I think for the most part, I usually do that with pop stuff because a lot of the stuff I do is a little bit like the, like Chaz said, um, a little bit warmer and whatever. And so sometimes I'll, I'll be working on something pop and it's like, man, it's just got to hit harder and be brighter and wider. And so I'll check out somebody else's settings because it's something that I wouldn't push as hard naturally. Mm -hmm. But when I hear it on the mix, it's like, okay, that's cool. Right on. Um, well, so, dude, we've been going a good long stretch here, um, and I want to jump to a closing question that I like to ask guests on the show um, and begin by saying thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. This is awesome to hang out with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so this is a hypothetical question. We're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine, and you get to go back in time and find young Chad um, who's maybe playing organ, learning how to play organ like a mad scientist, which we didn't get to talk about that, but that it, to me, the, the greatest ham and organ technique is to act like a mad scientist and it makes all organ over, overdubs sound better. <laughs> but you're going to go back in time and find yourself um, and say, listen, dude, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go give yourself if you could? Wow, that's a big question. We don't ask um, small I, questions here on <laughs> recording studio rocks. I would say the most important thing is maybe. Hmm, I mean, I would say an equal mix of make it till you fake it, and just um, don't be afraid to ask questions, even in big scenarios. Um, okay, for instance. Um, I was doing a string session for, on that Christina Perry Thousand Years song. And I just went to the assistant and said, man, I've read about using decatries. I've read about recording a 20-piece string section. I've never done it. Can you help me? And he's like, yeah, we do string sessions, string sessions here all the time. Like, I'll totally help. Here's what I'd recommend. And you can kind of lean on guys in larger studios like that when it's like, okay, I think I'm a great engineer. I think this, I think that but I don't have the experience he has in that scenario. And it's okay to just be like, you know what, just help me. And I think they like that too. It's like, you come in here acting like you know everything and I work in this room every day. It's like, I think it's refreshing for them to be like, hey, you do this all the time. I need some help. Um, yeah, I've noticed a lot of your stories, you're an asker. That's one yeah. of your superpowers. <laughs> but on the flip side of that, um, and I'm not trying to like name drop here. These are just two funny stories. Uh, and it's kind of funny, but Chad Kroger from Nickelback was producing and I got somehow got asked to engineer um, through a mutual friend. 
for Avril Lavigne. And we spent like six months at Henson Studios. And that was before, I mean, I used to hire people to Melodyne because I was producing a lot at the time and I didn't know how to use it. And he's like, hey, can you Melodyne the vocal? I'm like, yeah, of course. And he's like, you know how to use it, right? I'm like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and like, I'm just going to go use the bathroom really quick. <laughs> and I remember going to the bathroom and just watching like a six minute tutorial, like, okay, 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 okay. Like I understand the principles, but I've actually never done it. And I came back and, you know, I'm loading her vocal in and, and he's like, why are you not using the multi-tool? I'm like, oh, sometimes, yeah, that's probably better. And I kind of like, man, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back and go like, okay, multi-tool, Melodyne. Okay. Yeah. So you use it. Okay. Come back and like, oh man, I, yeah, I, I figured it out. The mouse, mouse was being weird. Like, here's how you do it. And it, it totally ended up working out. And then I get this great training on the spot while like this big pop artist is watching me tune her vocal and it's like, just do it. Wow. Um, but I think, you know, all of those scenarios of recording different people, um, playing in cover bands, playing with real bands, whatever scenario. One of my friends one time was like, because I played in a cover band for Tulsa, in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a while. And at the time I was complaining, saying like, man, I just want to play real music and I don't want to do these covers. And he was like, man, I'm jealous that you get to be on stage because every time you're on stage, that's, you basically, like you know how to be on stage. You're not worried about if something, if something happens. It's just good experience. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're going to look more natural the more times you are. And he's like, I get to play once every two months and I just look awkward because I don't have that. And I think it's similar in the studio where it's like, okay, you have someone standing behind a microphone waiting for you to get a sound, waiting for this. And every single time you do that, you're a little bit less nervous. You're a little bit cooler when something bad happens. I mean, minute one, when Third Eye Blind got to my studio, they asked me if I could help them with these songs. And I was like, man, I was such a fan of this band in the 90s. And they walk in and it's like, we're getting drum sounds and my computer completely just crashes. That's, that's like the, the appropriate was, time for computers to crash. They always pick the very best time. Exactly. And I remember it took us like 38 minutes of like plugging the RAM in and out until like we could get Pro Tools to recognize the RAM and the computer to start back up. And just kind of being like, you know what, like I've been in scenarios that are like, you know, there's a lot of people staring at you and I'm just going to keep my head down and fix this and know that we're going to, it's going to work at some point and they can be frustrated and I have to ignore it because when it starts working, they'll be cool. And so I think um, being younger, you sometimes are nervous about those situations or putting yourself into a position where you're uncomfortable. And every time you do that, you get that experience and you're not, you're just not, you're just cool the next time it happens. I've noticed that with older engineers, anytime they're in the room and it's like, hey, this isn't working. And they're like, okay, cool. Let's just throw up a different mic. Yeah. And it's always like, they're just cool about it. Yeah. Um, I remember hearing so stories like that too early on. And it was like, you know, the difference too is that when, when we're younger and we start freaking out about something not working, it's just like, it's like a, it's like a little poison that just kind of starts going out across the session, you know, and it doesn't help anything. Yeah. Like in the Beatles documentary, Glenn Johns is setting stuff up and fixing things. And the, the Beatles, the biggest fan in the world, are like, hey, obviously impatient, like, let's go. And he's just ignoring it and just like, I'm going to fix this. I can figure it out. And he does. Plus, he's the best dressed guy on the session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That helps too. But yeah, I think it's just, you know, just remain chill and be a good hang and be, uh, just make them feel comfortable. And I think if you never lose your cool, then they're going to see that and be like, man, we had some big issues and it, it wasn't his fault and he handled it well. And now I feel better. That's great, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for joining us in Recording Studio Rockstars. It's been a super honor to have you on the show and a lot of fun just getting to meet you and listening to all these cool, badass tricks. Now I got to go. I've already been like going on reverb. I'm like, oh, it's that much. <laughs> but I mean, you know, like the, uh, there's, I love your approach to making records and it's very inspiring to us. So let the Rockstars know where should they go online to just go find you? Where would you like them to go uh, learn more about you? And check out your stuff. I know you've got a website. Um, and what if they're just ready to reach out to you to make their next hit record? I mean, yeah, just email me, chadcopeland at gmail.com or find me on Instagram. I feel like a lot of people, most people message me on Instagram and say, hey, I really like this record. How did you get this sound? And I always, I like that. I like talking to people and I'm such a gear nut. I'm like, and I always ask, like, how technical do you want me to get? Because I love 
telling you every single thing we did and everything we used. And I don't That's want to awesome. be annoying. So just, you know, give me like a, if this is what you want, I'll, I'll dive in. Uh, but yeah, I would say Instagram is the best place to reach me. I'm a little bit of a ghost on the internet, not on purpose. Um, You're just busy plugging in. Um, I'm, just, I'm just busy. <laughs> hooking up words and phrases like conjunction junction. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, man. I'm dropping a lot of old school references on you today. <laughs> I love it. Um, dude, thanks so much, man. It's it's awesome. I look forward to meeting you in person and um, hope you have a great weekend, man. And thanks yeah, very much for well. listening, Rockstars. All right. Talk soon. Bye. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. API, OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Sonarworks, and Isotope. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plugin purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of their plugins. And sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. And don't forget to use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of the podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Weselchenko, Braden Streming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks, guys. And thanks so much for listening, Rockstars. We'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.